right? Because because if we're honest about what we have to do as storytellers, we have these we have our listeners' souls in our in our hands, right? Cupped in our hands. They, if you're a good writer, as soon as you've plunge the the uh, the reader into your world you're responsible for what happens to that person in that world it's it's scary yeah but it's it's true so you have to unsettle them you have to go to dark places you have to mess up their their very comfortable presuppositions about what the world is but you also have to do it in a way that reinforces the pattern the pattern of reality as you talk about all the time mm-hmm. that's an incredibly hard thing to do technically as storytellers and that's the challenge that's ahead of us and that's what martin shaw is doing uh in in talking about his uh, that quote specifically he writes really bizarre weird stuff that's very fringe and very like kind of prose poetry kind of stuff that's that's very on the verge of of paganism christianity inspired by um you know the ancient myths but also speaking them in a language that's understandable and if you allow yourself to enter into it it can be really very interesting and very transformative in a lot of ways. Hmm. And so who do you see as being, do you see Loris as being an example of that? Yes. For example? Right. Yeah. Loris is funny because uh, on the one hand, it's, it's very, it's a very conventional narrative. It's, it's, it follows all the beats of the saints, saint life mm-hmm. of a particular kind of saint life. But if you're paying attention, um, there's a, and if you're reading it carefully, especially if you're reading it in Russian, it, the translation is good, but it doesn't it doesn't do absolute justice, as no translation, of course, can. I can say that I'm a translator. <laughs> uh, um, it, there are some profoundly shocking moments in Loris. There's some really awful things that happen in Loris. Um, the the death of of his of his wife and child, uh, and the, uh, you know the inciting incident that leads to his yeah. becoming a saint. They're described in details that nobody should ever describe when talking about women and children. Yeah. Um, really horrifying stuff so that's one thing then there's also like he pushes the limits of what of what we consider to be saintly yeah when you have sure. the, the when you have the pugnacious uh fools for christ you know duking it out while yeah. walking on water walking on water yeah man that <laughs> stuff is crazy i mean a lot of people are like this you can't have this this isn't this isn't right but if you've yeah. heard and also the verge would... on masochism which he brings his character yes. to you're sometimes you're wondering like is this just a kind of strange uh, masochism, like a kind of yeah. nihilistic masochism, or is this an actual negation of self? Like when he lets himself get stung by all the mosquitoes and stuff, and you're like, what? You know, really? Well, yes. And well, actually, that I think you may have taken that from, from an actual life of one of the Russian saints. Yeah. Um, so that that has that has happened. <laughs> but even like, like, that's the thing about the lives of the saints, too, is that when you read them, there is is yeah. some of that in there, right? We we yes. tend to iron out the lives of the saints or the medieval legends. We've kind of made them nice and clean. Even the fairy tales, yeah. we made them nice and clean. A lot of the versions of the fairy tales that we have now have have taken out all the strangeness that was there just a few, yep. few centuries ago. And that's been one of my ideas is to how can we bring back the strangeness or some of the things that are that seem off color to to contemporary morality or sensibilities but use it in a way that is re- revelatory rather than just mm-hmm. uh, a kind just of shocking. scandal for scandal or shocking right shocking right. like i've been thinking about like the rapunzel for example but in the original mm-hmm. rapunzel stories rapunzel gets pregnant in the tower we've yeah. expunged that completely from all the versions that we tell our kids yeah. But I kept thinking without that, it actually is weakening what the story is about. And the idea of the man who forgets the mother of his children, you know, in this in his fall and then has to mm-hmm. hear her voice again in order to recognize her. I'm like, no, we need to put that back in. Like, is, is there a way yeah. to put it back in, even in a story for kids, uh, especially in a moment where kids are no longer like naive, innocent in, and, and innocent the way that we wish they were. Like, is there a way well, to you, you say no longer, but I'm not sure if they ever were. If they honest. ever were, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so is there a way to put that Thought back in? Childhood? <laughs> to, to put it back in, which would reveal a higher aspect of the story rather than just be for shock. But that's just, that's edgy. Like for kids, it's not that hard because you won't go as far. But for adults, yeah. it's a, how can I say this? Like it's a, it can be really tricky because there's well, so much, so much of the modern fiction is like, is shock. A lot of it has a lot of shock for shock value for sure. All right. So CC Serretta asks, so hi, Jonathan, I read Loris. Good book. Thanks for the recommendation. 
Uh, in an unwinding and fusing world characterized by multiplicity, Arsene falls in love with a stranger. He fails to properly connect his earthly relationship to unity spirit, and it ends in catastrophe. Driven by the unify unifying power of his love for the stranger, Arsene rises to spiritual unity where linear time becomes cyclical, and in doing so at the end of his life, circles back to his great failure and is able to correct it. Obviously more nuanced in the book, but am I getting the gist of the medieval symbolism? I mean, I think that that's a pretty good... It's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty nice uh, summary of what happens. You know, uh, it's a very complex book. It's really hard. It's something that really makes you think. It really is close to the level of Dostoevsky in terms of the complexity of the, of the actions that the character is taking and the complexity of the, of the reasons why he's doing things and you, you, you know, and the action he's doing. So it's, I mean, it's definitely worth reading. All right, so Lord Marduk. Wow, Lord Marduk is asking me questions. So a question about the ending of the novel, Loris, and any more thoughts you have on the novel and how it compares to our current situation. Spoiler alert, okay? At the end of the novel, they drag his body through the field after his tribute services. I imagine it was a way to heal the land and the outsider observing it was a stranger, was a strange thing to do. Observing it was a strange thing to do. Is there a particular ritual in Russian folktales or, or religion that points to dragging his body through the field? There is a plague during the time of the novel. Uh, it has to do that in the in the Laura story. It really does have to do with the the problem of the holy fool. It has to do with the problem of the the person who wants to kind of evacuate himself into the world, and so the you can understand that scene as it's a desecration of his body. He wants his body to be desecrated. Um, and you would say, why would he want his body to be des desecrated? And this is where the extremes meet. This is where, this is, at least I think this is the desire to be shown in the, in the book. This is where the extremes meet. This is where the Christian martyr who is desecrated the Christian martyrs are always desecrated, right? Their bodies, the, their bodies are always uh, are always are always desecrated, and that desecration ends up to their glory. Now, it doesn't mean that desecration is good. Most people should not have their body desecrated. Most people should be should be properly buried. And in the novel, he talks about that problem too, because he, 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 he cries because his, the, this, the lover he has at the beginning of the book that she is, is not because she's not going to be properly buried. And so he has this kind of anguish about that at the beginning. Um, but that's the, the idea is that in his case, at least that's the way I understand it. Uh, he is going to the end of his to his holy fool persona, and he is asking for his body to be desecrated, and that is to his to his highest glory. Um, but it's it's like I said, it's dangerous stuff, man. It's dangerous stuff because you. you you have to be able to tell the difference between what the holy fool does and a masochist. Those two things are not the same, right? A masochist who, who, who wants to be humiliated for his own pleasure is not the same as a saint who is desecrated to his glory. Um, and, and I know that it's, it, it's tricky because we, we see confusion about that in, in popular culture. There is some confusion about that. Um, but those two things are, in a way, they're opposites. They're not, they're just not the same at all. So, um, 